Basically, the argument is that uh, racialization is a process through which races are created. And race is a concept that came into being in the, in the 1700s. Racialization is a process through which we select and sort based on phenotypic characteristics, for one thing, and then create certain oppositions, you know, white, black, coiled hair, straight hair, thick nose, you know, thin nose, European, African, and create a hierarchy based on that. Those who are racialized as white are on top and those who are racialized as black are on bottom. And then certain stereotypes come into being and then essentialization happens. And then finally that turns into action based on those supposed immutable differences, racism. So, okay. So aren't we all against the thing that you just, the process that you just got through describing? I would say so. I mean, are you, would you say you're against that? Absolutely. Okay. So how could I have been on the other side of that argument? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I hadn't finished completely making the argument yet or laying it out. No wonder I have no recollection of it. (laughs) Where we differed, basically, is that I make a, a clear distinction between race, the process of creating races, racialization, a racial worldview, and culture. Cultural intelligence, a cultural worldview. I make a clear distinction okay, yeah, because I think because I think analytically, it's very important to make that dis- distinction so we don't conflate the two. The beautiful, positive, uh, generative aspects of Black American culture that you love and identify with, from the music to the dance to the food to our style, all of that is something that I put in the cultural realm. We don't have to continue equating the race part with the culture part. This is not quite a coherent, in no way is it meant to be a rebuttal, but it's just a a kind of visceral thing of, why am I doing this? Okay, so so race is bad. Race. Race is the evil thing. It's the the bugaboo. Race. Race. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm a black man. You know, I mean, the only reason I'm having this conversation about race is because I'm a black man. I guess you're going to call that culture. I I guess you're going to say that my choice of this woman with darker skin who's going to have my children if she's willing. And that one with a Caucasian look. And I want to marry, quote unquote, within the race. And I I guess that's going to be somehow kind of reductive and and, uh, you know, believing in a false God or something like that. The meanings that I'm attaching to this, the meanings, the significance, the significations. Yeah. Okay. Now, that's not a theory of uh, essentialism. It, it, and it could be called a cultural reaction. Every society will have people who come to the point of, let's say, choosing who their mates are or what they're going to work on in their life or where they're going to give their money uh, to support the cause or what histories, what narratives they attach them, you know, mm-hmm. that that that's something. And if, and if it just happens that I'm interested in W.E.B. Du Bois' Souls of Black Folks, and, and I read it and I think, my people, okay? It just so happens that that correlates with this. You're going to call that culture, and you're going to say, we're not in the race business. It, it's, it feels like splitting hairs to me. It feels like, it, it feels, in a, in a quixotic in, in a way, because the thing is so, damn, am I going to tell the Jews, don't be Jewish? Well, this is something. Oh, but that's not race. That's not race. That's culture. You're going to tell me, except if I want to get into uh, Israel, I got to get past some rabbis who are going to ask me who my mother was. And, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not singling out the Jews. I'm, I'm, not, against, I'm, not, I'm not against people saying marry a Jewish woman and have Jewish children. Please, my son. I'm not against people saying that. I'm just saying they're not bigots for saying that. Right. And neither is a black man who says Malcolm X. Right. He's right. not deluded. Right. And that's not my point of, of delusion. We are a people. We are a, a, we are an ethnocultural group, no question, with a certain history, with traditions that have been built. There's no question. I'm just saying that I can maintain and admit all of that my, without myself 
holding on to the concept of race, the process of racialization and a way of seeing the world as a racial worldview. I don't have to attach myself to that. Now, Glenn, if you want to, that's your choice. I mean, I am about definitely giving people the choice, but I'm, I'm trying to make a case that for us to get to transracial humanism, the transracial part will be assisted by us consciously making a distinction between race and culture, disavowing race per se, embracing culture, embracing peoplehood, embracing history, because otherwise, I think we we go we, we stay on this merry-go-round, and we'll I don't see us being able to get to transracial humanism without something like a deracialization. We should define transracial humanism. It says there's a realm above this identitarian realm. Right. There's a human realm. Right. And it transcends my my loyalties to my tribe are real but they're not the ultimate loyalty. Something like that, you know. Thank you. Thank you. There's a black woman sitting on the United States Supreme Court, Katanji Brown Jackson. She was appointed by a man, a Democratic president, who said before he was elected that if he got elected, that's what he was going to do. I'm saying with great respect, uh, horse is out of the barn, man. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, you, you can push on a string all you want to. You're not going to reweave the fabric by pushing on the string. We need, we need a better strategy with great respect than the preachy, you know, can't we just all get beyond this thing, this, 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 you know, whatever. Again, I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying it courses out of the barn on this, on, on, on race. Yeah, for sure. No argument. But the horse was out of the barn when, when people believed in witches and they had the Salem witch trials and we got beyond that. Uh, the, the horse was out of the barn when we had a feudal system where, you know, you had lords and kings. And of course, some of that is still in existence, but we evolved from that, you know. I thought you said people weren't deluded if they got excited about a black woman at the U.S. Supreme Court. I, I, I thought those feelings that they had of exaltation and pride were legitimate. I, I thought you said that they were legitimate. They, are, are, they, are they deluded or not? They, they well, believe in witches? They, they believe in witches if they think Katanji Brown Jackson is the fulfillment of some idealized notion about what it means to be included in America? That they're mistaken? I'm not saying folks are dumb, stupid, deluded. No, all I'm saying is I'm trying to lay out an analytical case that there is a better way to conceive of oneself that doesn't confine oneself to racial categorization. See, Arya alluded to your, a narrative, a presentation that you gave at yeah. MIT, the bias versus the development narrative on different views of African-American disadvantage. That was the title of your presentation. I think that's a key bias versus development narrative. Would you mind summarizing the thesis and okay. so we could talk about that a bit? If a white cop does something to a black kid, mm -hmm. never mind whether or not the cop's whiteness had anything to do with what happened. It becomes a racial incident mm -hmm. and becomes Emmett Till, 1955 or whatever. It becomes a familiar story about what black people have to do with the bias narrative. If our kids are behind in school, if there are too many of them in prison, if they're not making the same money, if they're not in tech coding in tech land in Silicon Valley, it's because of bias. The narrative is absolutely compelling. When you're inside of that narrative and that's the lens through which you see the world, it's absolutely compelling. The development narrative. The development narrative is a different way of giving an account. It's a different way of telling the story. And it puts its stress not on the outside, not on what the environment has or hasn't bequeathed, but on the inside, about agency, about empowering oneself, mm -hmm. about mastery. You were speaking of Ellison sitting in Oklahoma, about command over the environment that one helps to create for oneself. One's fate is not fully determined by the uh, inheritance of whatever. One is an agent with free will and with possibilities. Starting businesses, creating, being competitive and productive, 
That's a very different thing than if your focus is on keeping a litany and an account of what wrongs have been done for you and going around with your hand out saying you must do, you must do, you must do. Totally different way of being in the world. Right. So I was advocating for the development narrative. I was saying, okay, for black people now, I'm speaking of black people. And in, in a certain way, I'm speaking to black people. And I'm saying, hey, forgive me for comparing myself to Leo Strauss, but just as Leo Strauss said, what do we owe to our forefathers? That, you know, we owe them more than Al Sharpton. If you say transracial humanism, Greg, there are political implications. I don't think, frankly, me, Glenn Lowry, and I, I call myself a race man, that the color of the left Democrat politician who happens to be representing a district has a whole lot to do with my understanding about my people, about their possibilities, about their future. And when I contemplate the poverty right. rate, the imprisonment rate, the SAT scores, uh, the, the general well-being, the out of wedlock like birth rate, the murder rate that's going on among my people, I feel agony about it. And part of that is because I identify as a black man and I'm not going to give that up. Uh, you haven't talked me out of that. Regarding the stories that we tell, Jewish Americans um, have a rather myopic perspective by and large about the meaning of Jewish identity. The overwhelming majority of Jewish Americans are Ashkenazi Jews and they've had a particular historical experience in America. The Jewish people as a whole transcends that uh, the Jewish people as a whole is Middle Eastern, it's North African, it's East European, Western European. It's got, it extends to South, South Asia. Jewish Americans find themselves uh, in a situation uh, in which they have become Americanized. So the question for a Jewish American is how can we transform that limitation? A, how can we see that as just one facet of the Jewish experience? and not the whole, because many Jewish, Jewish Americans miss the whole vision of, and you see it especially with Jewish Americans who buy into you know, the whiteness of Jews and they speak a language which is completely foreign to anything in the Jewish tradition. If Jewish Americans would really deeply open themselves up to the American character, to, to American culture, they have something which they can then profoundly bring into the Jewish tradition. And this is part of what I'm trying to do. The fact that we, that we have things done to us, we find ourselves in a situation in which our, our identity is imposed upon us. Uh, and I think that would be the parallel to the black American condition, situation that you're describing. The question is, well, what do I do with this now? It's an, I need to see it as an opportunity. The only people that I know in, in the United States who speak in these terms, which really brings you from the heroic perspective to the heights of human achievement, have been black Americans. You know, the omni-American tradition from Gene Toomer to Duke Ellington to... Zora Neale Hurston, Wynton Marsalis. Her, Ellison you know, Murray, yeah. Crouch, Greg Thomas. Charles Johnson, Absolutely. Danielle Allen. Right. And so I, I think that the, the Jewish American, if we're going to make the parallel, we have to, the Jewish Americans have to remember that they are a small slice of the Jewish people. I wonder how you okay. react to this. So Black Panther, the movie. Wakanda, forever. <laughs> Wakanda! Okay. Right. So that's fiction. Right. State of Israel is a real political thing. So the, the, right. the, the, the wheels of history, you know, <laughs> have the creation of the Jewish state as a, a, a project within the 20th, 21st century evolution of, you know, global politics and uh, have African-Americans, uh, I'm going to say this unkindly, uh, living a pipe dream. That, where's your power? I can raise $100 million and make a film. And it has cultural cachet because, well, George Floyd. But I can't actually stand up an army. I don't run any banks. Well, yeah. I'll stop. Power. The, no, no, no. The point is power. Okay. Okay. Right. So right. when we put an right. army okay. Okay. behind these uh, uh, reflections about identity and, and, and essence and whatnot, 
we got a whole new ball game. In a hundred years, maybe it'll be more like what the Irish or the Italian of, of uh, 1890 or 1910 within the American cultural political matrix, where they were very insular, distinct, you know, identifiable, almost racially, quote unquote, almost racialized into something now where, you know, you still have St. Patrick's Day and you still have Italian restaurants and whatnot, but it's a very thin. They're wearing that thing. They can take it off in a heartbeat. The intermarriage rates are high. The, the level of, of, you know, identity closure is very low. So 100 years from now, if that's what blackness meant within the American context, I'd be fine with that. How can it be the case that that Jewish Americans and Jewish folks in other places can look very closely at anti-Semitism and track it by its narrative, in a sense? So how can they still track the bias narrative while they clearly also exercise the agency of the development narratives if we're posing them as binaries? I think history leaves the Jewish people with no choice but to attend uh, assiduously to the earliest uh, emanations of the uh, forces that culminated in the early mid 20th century in Europe to led to such a disaster for the Jewish people. They can't be indifferent to that. But it's not the main thing they're doing. Hmm. It's not. It's, it's, it's one amongst many things that they're doing, but <laughs> they're also building businesses and acquiring mastery over uh, uh, substantive uh, areas of, uh, of human endeavor and uh, creating realities on the ground of uh, effective uh, expressions of their human potential. They're not filling up the jails. Their kids are not running around without fathers. They, they're learning how to read and write and count uh, and, and a lot more uh, that manifests itself all the way up to the very top of human excellence. So I, I don't know that there's anything close to a comparison. Yeah, think about reparations. I'm not saying there aren't any Jews who are interested in reparations, and I know that the banks in Switzerland are hearing from some lawyers somewhere about some assets that, or have heard and, and whatever. So I'm not, you know, but I, I also know that uh, the payment of reparations to the state of Israel by the state of Germany was extremely controversial in Israel because you can't put a price on my ancestors suffering right. and whatnot. I, I agree with you. We hear a lot about the Holocaust. I'm just saying, I agree, Greg, that the Jewish people and American politics do play the bias narrative card, quote unquote, to a certain degree, but it doesn't keep them from getting, taking care of their business. We're not taking care of our business. Well, our kids not- are running around at two o'clock in the morning in the streets of name well, a city. Well, okay. Uh, cut, cut it, cutting up or worse. And they are vastly overrepresented amongst people who are failing to keep up with the modern world in 21st century America. That's the development project that I, I am calling attention to. And I don't think there's anything comparable to that relevant to, uh, to American Jews. That's my answer. 